All right, well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is James Ramirez, and we want to welcome you to the Sound Careers in Healthcare event, Envision Your Future and Keep It in Focus. We are having this event all week long, today all the way through Friday. So we want you to be coming back with us every day. This is one of those events that you don't want to miss because we've got prizes, we have speakers, we have professionals, we have uh, movers and shakers. We've got lots of different people ready to give you all their best information and to help you keep your vision in focus. So thank you for joining. We do want to pay special attention to four of our top sponsors. They are Pierce College, Clover College, Technical College, AHEC, Western Washington, and Seattle Children's. Thank you to all of our sponsors. Few things to keep consideration of, and I'll just kind of go over these briefly. Uh, some topics can be uncomfortable for some and hard to discuss. Remember, you always have the right to excuse yourself and uh, excuse yourself from the session. Make sure and speak from your own experiences and trust the experiences of others. Stay engaged and active and respect confidentiality. And if you notice, this is kind of a webinar style where you can see the speakers, you can hear us, but we, uh, in order for students to communicate with us, they're going to be using the messaging and the ask a question box. Before we actually get started, we're going to do a land recognition, and I, I'm going to have a few slides on this. Uh, the first one is describing what a land recognition is. A land acknowledgement is a formal recognizes and respects indigenous peoples and traditions, stewards of this land and the enduring relationships that exist between indigenous peoples and their traditional territories. We offer land acknowledgement because native land was taken by force and colonized to form the United States as we know it today. Through this process, which is ongoing through systemic oppression, native identity, history, and land ownership, has been ignored by colonizers and attempted to be erased. Land acknowledgement is the first step in opposing the systematic oppression and historic erasure of native people and native land ownership. We have learned that the act of land acknowledgement is powerful and requires deeper research, analysis, relationship building, and action to do it with integrity. This was drawn out from the Green Seattle Partnership. We acknowledge that this gathering is a taking place throughout the traditional territories of the Coastal Salish and other allied bands signatory to the 1855 Treaty of Point Elliot, including the Snohomish, Duwamish, Tulalip, Suquamish, Stiliguamish, Nisqually, Payula, Coastal Salish, and Muckleshoot tribes. We recognize the stewardship of Washington's green spaces by the Coast Salish people since time Memorial the disruption of this work by colonization and now endeavor to continue this work. Thank you. Here's a few things to expect from this event. Uh, just to give you an overall, you're here today, so thank you for joining. On days two and three, we do have uh, different events happening. On day two, we have a student and healthcare practitioner panels. That's tomorrow. On day three, on Wednesday, we have healthcare profession presentations. There's going to be varied uh, concurrent sessions happening on days three and four. And then on day five, it's chart your next steps. So make sure and be with us every day from 3 to 4.30 p.m. And we're really glad that you're here today. One of the special things that we have, uh, as you know, you entered into the Cadence platform. That is all this environment that you see with us right now. And what we have is we have activity leaderboards. And we're going to be showing the leaderboards every day starting tomorrow. What it is, it's recognition for staying engaged. So this is a list of all the different ways that you can earn points to make sure you're on the leadership board. You can attend each day. Just by attending today, right now, you are getting points. Uh, when you complete the session surveys, you're gonna get more points. In addition to the feedback forms, uh, when you ask a question, whether it's in this plenary style or even in your breakouts, you get more points. So make sure you're staying active and engaged. And then of course, in the last part, we have envision your future activities. We're gonna provide those links to you and that's another way to get points, but not only get points, you also can win prizes. So for the activity leaderboards, we're gonna be showing it every day. It's gonna have all the leaders that are doing all the activities. And at the end of the week, we're gonna have the top five overall leaders. They're gonna win a cash prize. 
And I'm gonna get more into those cash prizes later. But before we do, I do wanna highlight the theme is in the future and keep it in focus. When we think of that, well, I have an exercise for everyone to do here. I want everyone that can see me on screen right now, close your eyes. Go ahead and just close your eyes. Yes, I can see that your eyes are open, so make sure that you close your eyes. What I want you to do is envision the future that you want in your profession in 10 years from now. Where are you at? What are you doing? What were you working at? How did you get there? Who are the colleagues around you? And envision that future. And on the count of three, I'm gonna ask you to open your eyes. One, two, three. Wow, you are now that professional. We want you to have that vision in your mind. You are that professional that you wanna be in 10 years and we're gonna help you get there. So keep that vision in the forefront of your head and keep that in the way that you dialogue with us and keep those questions coming. And now I have a special keynote, a special moderator. It's Dr. Molly Brignall. Uh, she is a professional and we'll let her kind of take away, but she has been a physician for over 22 years uh, in her history. She continually works in healthcare and is a leader in the industry. So without further ado, Molly, I'm going to send this over to you. If you want to get your slide deck ready, I'm going to go ahead and take off mine and give you yours. Uh, thank you everybody for joining and welcome to Sound Careers in Healthcare 2022. Hi everyone, I'm Molly Brignall. I'm also a nutrition instructor at Highline College. Um, I will be your moderator this afternoon and we have three keynote speakers. Um, if you have any questions, don't forget to put them in the questions area. And then if you have any comments or if you wanna give props to the speakers, you put them in the messaging center. Um, if we, at the end of each speaker, we will um, try to answer all of the questions. And if we don't get to all the questions, then we will put them in the resource tile on the website. Um, our first speaker today is Alex Rodriguez. He is a first year medical student. So give some props, give, give some high fives to soon to be Dr. Rodriguez. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining today. Um, and it's a great honor to be here with you all and share a little bit more about my journey. Uh, so the goal of me today is to be able to share about my experiences and my background and how those experiences have led me to where I am today. And hopefully uh, my story can resonate with some of your own stories and hopefully motivate you to go in the health or any other health related career that you hope to pursue in the future. Uh, so I'd like to start off by talking, talking a little bit more about my general background. So I'm originally from a small town in Eastern Washington called Wenatchee. Um, my family immigrated from Mexico, I wanna say around three decades ago. Um, and uh, as a result, a lot of my family are also farm workers. So I grew up working in the agricultural fields. I picked apples, cherries, and pears throughout uh, the, the school year and also during the summer. So I was able to get exposed to a different lifestyle in terms of health disparities. Uh, and talking a little bit more about health disparities, I was able to see a lot of the issues that were affecting uh, the community or individuals who were in my community. And it inspired me to uh, seek a career to make an impact and change some of change some of the health disparities affecting my community. I went to the University of Washington for undergrad, where I majored in biology, uh, and then I eventually went to UW for medical school, where I am currently at. So here I have a few pictures. Um, I feel like a picture sh shows a lot of of experiences and also enriches what uh, one is trying to depict. So here's, uh, I went to Wenatchee High School uh, for high school and um, I wanna say it, it was a split between like 50% Latinos and 50% uh, other races. Um, but I, it really gave me a sense of community because I was able to work with a lot of individuals and also go to school with other students who came from similar backgrounds as me um, growing up, I 
used to live in a mobile home community. Uh, so here's depicted on the top middle. Uh, he, I grew up moving from one place to the other, given that I grew up in a low income household. So we oftentimes had to move from one place to the other, depending on the season and also uh, the year. The picture on the right is a picture of my parents. Um, I'm gonna give them a shout out for all their hard work and all they have done for me, because I know I wouldn't be where I am today without their support. Um, so here in the picture on the bottom left, we have a picture of me working in the agricultural fields. You can see that there's some cherry fruits in the background. And then here in the center, we have a, what well, seems to be a trailer. And this is a mobile uh, outreach clinic that um, is very important in my, in my personal story, given that that's where I used to get medical attention and medical and dental uh, treatment as well. So I'll go and talk a little bit more about this in debt, uh, but I just wanted to briefly go over, like show you all uh, these pictures because they really reflect all the experiences I was able to go through while I was growing up here in the Wenatchee Valley. So just a general sense, uh, here you can see that it's just like a general overview of my education. I'm starting off from Wenatchee High School, going to the University of Washington for undergrad, and then uh, medical school. But this technically, it, although it shows my journey through education, it doesn't really uh, provide information in terms of all the barriers and all my experiences that I had to go through. And I want to talk a little bit more about that uh, in today's presentation. So I'd like to start off by talking a little bit more about my high school experience. Um, so I am a ESL student, meaning that uh, English isn't my first language. So I had to go through many hoops um, in high school. So I was placed in um, remediation classes and also uh, English as a second language classes as well. And that put me in a place that uh, allowed me to uh, get a different sense in terms of the importance of like putting effort in school and the importance of reaching out to people. Uh, but it wasn't until my senior year of high school that I began to see how um, my experiences uh, um, as a first generation college student uh, would affect me in the long term. So in my parents, since they didn't go to college and no one in my family had gone to college, no one had explained to me about the process of applying to college. And it seemed that college wasn't really emphasized for me growing up, um, but it wasn't until I started to participate in certain programs such as the college mentor program that I was able to become inspired into going into college. So here I just have a brief glimpse in terms of the things that were new to me. For instance, the ACT. So I did not understand or I didn't know about this test. So typically um, high school students who are hoping to go to college must take standardized tests. Uh, and one of those tests is the, called the ACT. And then I also have here on the right a picture of college application. Um, given that I was the first gen in my family to seek uh, a college uh, career or going to college, it was really difficult for me because I didn't understand the importance of knowing how to write a college essay and then having other people who were able to give me some tips. Um, but once I was able to learn more about those uh, the available resources and also uh, what I could use to get into college, I was able to su successfully apply to various schools. But that wasn't the end of the college application process because at the end, when you get accepted to a school, you have to think about the finances. And that's something else that I didn't really think about when I was in high school. So I found that it was very important for me to reach out to other people because they were able to provide me more information about scholarships, the importance of filling out your FAFSA and stuff like that. Eventually, um, I was able to apply and successfully get admitted to the University of Washington. But that was another obstacle that I had to encounter. Once I got to the University of Washington, I went from going from to school with like 30 people in my class to a group of 300 people in a certain amount of class. So that really was a big adjustment in terms of 
of going from a small town to a big town and also going from high school to college. And also once I got to college, I found that the studying methods that worked for me in high school weren't always effective in college. So I had to find uh, different methods and also reach out to professors, reach out to other peers who were also uh, able to provide me some direction and give me some tips and advice into going uh, into being successful in college. And this is where I began to have a general idea about what I wanted to do in the long term, which was eventually go to medical school and become a physician. But even then, like I did not really understand uh, what it took in order for one person to go to, from high school, college to medical school. Uh, and fortunately, I was able to participate in certain programs such as the College Assistant Migrant Program. And they they were able to walk me through the process of of going of being successful in undergrad and also completing the requirements needed to successfully enroll in medical school. So I was also able to apply and get admitted to the Genome ABA program, which is a program dedicated for individuals who wanted to do research, who were interested in going to a health healthcare related career. And that really allowed me to see also uh, the importance of doing well in school and also uh, what I needed to do in order to be a successful applicant to medical school. Um, eventually in 2019, I was able to graduate uh, from the University of Washington which, with a bachelor's in biology. Um, I feel like this picture is very dear to my heart because it not only shows my family, but it also shows uh, all their dedication, all their hard work, and being able to be the first person in my family to graduate college and be able to show my siblings and family and other community uh, neighbors that it is possible that with hard work, you are able to achieve your dreams. But at this point, it was very difficult for me to um, transition straight into medical school. So I wanted to seek different ways in which I could not only make myself more uh, competitive in terms of applying to medical school, but also learn about what exactly uh, there is to do in, in, the healthcare related, uh, in a healthcare related career. So I took two gap years and during those two gap years, I was able to do a lot of things that allow me to grow both as a person and also as a professional. Um, so I started off by working as an AmeriCorps member at the UW School of Dentistry. Uh, so I was able to do a lot of outreach work and also um, inter inter interact with other healthcare related uh, career students. So they were able to give me some tips and also give me some ideas in terms of how they were able to end up where they are today. I was also able to work at the health district here in Wenatchee. Um, so that was during the where during the time when COVID-19 started to affect our world. So I was able to make an impact by being a case and contact investigator. So I was uh, reaching out to people and making sure that they had the resources that they needed uh, to be healthy and also just following up with them as well. And this allowed me to see the different health disparities that were affecting my community. Um, I was also able to work as a uh, agricultural worker once again uh, so I worked in the cherries, picking um, picking cherries again. Um, and that allowed me to see the different health disparities affecting specifically my community. Although a lot of people were able to work from home, uh, not a lot of individuals uh, had the opportunity to do so as well. Uh, and that served true for mm -hmm. individuals uh, who were farm workers. So that allowed me to see uh, the different aspect of medicine in terms of individuals who oftentimes are neglected or don't have a voice and whose needs are often not addressed. After completing these two uh, service years, um, I decided to continue my journey on becoming a physician, um, but that's when I had to learn more about the admissions process. And the admissions process was a definitely another journey. So I did, not un I did not initially know that you had to take another standardized exam. So this time it's called the MCAT, which is the Medical College Admissions Test. 
Uh, so this test um, is composed of all the basic science that you learn in undergrad, which includes gen chem, o chem, bio, physics, uh, math, and also a few of the social sciences as well. Um, and this exam was very difficult for me personally, because given that I was a ESL student or a English as a second language student, I oftentimes struggled um, completing the exam within the given time frame. And I also struggled in the reading section. Um, and I oftentimes, I remember while I was studying for this exam, I oftentimes began to question whether or not uh, medical school was the correct uh, career for me, given that I was struggling on this test. So I remember that I specifically reached out to a few of my mentors who gave me some ideas, but I slowly began to uh, make some progress thanks to like the tips that they were able to offer me. Um, and eventually I was able to successfully take the MCAT and score high enough to um, start thinking about applying to schools. So once I took the MCAT, I began to work on the application process, which uh, is another beast on its own, um, which is the MCAS, the American Medical College Application Service. Um, and this process typically takes around a one year process. So it starts with you uh, filling out the application, getting interviews, and then being admitted. So given that, that I didn't really um, believe in, my, in myself in terms of having the ability to be accepted to several schools, I only applied to the University of Washington um, and I put myself in a very difficult position because I felt like I didn't have a shot. But after reaching out to people, after going through this process uh, and getting the support that I needed, I saw that uh, I was able to get admitted to the University of Washington. So here on the picture, I have my admissions letter stating that I was accepted into the University of Washington. So I want to end my presentation by giving you all some advice that I have found helpful and definitely have uh, spoken volumes in terms of where uh, I am today. Um, I would say one of the important things and one of the things you all can take advantage of right now is to explore, explore, explore. Uh, take all the opportunities you have to get uh, job shadowing experiences, to get involved in your community, to seek uh, different ways in which you can uh, enrich your personal and academic life as well. I will also say and emphasize that mentorship is also a very important thing that has definitely made an impact in terms of how I've been able to succeed and also being able to reach my goals. And I also want to share a quote from my mom who she always um, told me while I was growing up, don't let one failure determine the trajectory of your life. Learn from your mistakes, reach out to people and keep moving forward. It may take you longer than you would hope, but don't stop, it will be worth it. And I definitely have found that um, these special words shared by my mom have definitely shed some light on the different obstacles that everyone will encounter at some point during their journey, but you shouldn't let those obstacles um, affect your willing, your determination and your willingness to um, reach your goal. And I hope by sharing a little bit more about my story and my background that I've been able to uh, inspire you all to not only uh, seek a career, but also keep moving forward and to always reach out to other people who may be able to help you in the long term. So I'll turn it off to you, Dr. Molly. Thank you so much, Alex. That was, it was, you were very inspirational and you're getting some serious props in the messaging. If you want to look over there, you and your mom actually are <laughs> getting props. That's awesome. So there have, there are many questions, many questions, and we won't have time for all of them today. Um, but I, um, we'll ask some of them. Um, for example, if you had a chance to go back and change something, what would you do differently? Yeah, that's a definitely 
a really good question. I feel like if I could go back, I would definitely reach out to other schools early on and not limit myself in terms of how many schools I'm applying to. And I feel like uh, my fear to be rejected on several medical schools limited my options. Um, and I feel like if I could go back, I would tell myself, you know what, expand your options, give it a risk. You never know what could happen. Good advice. Mm -hmm. um, how did you overcome the challenges of learning English? Yeah, that's another great question. Um, so I feel like oftentimes I became self-conscious uh, by the fact that I wasn't able to fully communicate with other people. Uh, there were some instances where I tried to clarify myself or make myself heard, but oftentimes given that I feared that other people would judge me, I oftentimes limited myself. So I feel like something that has definitely helped me improve is putting myself out there, like putting me in a situation that would force me to get out of my comfort zone and make me, uh, allow me to speak for myself and for other people. That's awesome. Who would you recommend to, let's see, this is, okay. What kind of individuals would you recommend reaching out to for assistance, like advisors or professors or who? Yeah, one, one thing that you could start off with is just reaching out to uh, your advisors, like your college counselor or your high school counselor has some connection. So they may be able to direct you to an important uh, resource or service that could help you. I would say another thing you could do is also do some research on your own. There's definitely a lot of programs who uh, are seeking students to participate and allow them to like get exposure to different health professions. I know there's like the Community Health Professions Academy at the UW. There's also the nursing program as well. And you could also reach out to, let's say if you're interested in medicine, reach out to your own PCP, your own provider. They are more than happy to help you connect and possibly offer you a opportunity to do some job shadowing as well. It's true. <laughs> I used to do that for students all the time. Uh, what was one of the most enjoyable experiences you had when you were in school, college? I would say one of the opportunities that I truly enjoyed was being able to study abroad. So I was able to study abroad in Spain. Um, so that's another thing about going to college that there's a lot of opportunities that you can uh, participate in. And you never know, you may end up going, going to a place where you never imagined that you would be able to participate in. And I can talk a little bit more about my experience in medical school right now. Um, so one of the things that I've been able to do is actually see patients um, during my first year. So I've been able to do like a physical exam, um, gather some information about people's stories and trying to diagnose uh, an illness. And that's been very rewarding because I've been slowly and slowly being able to see how studying and um, putting myself in uncomfortable situations have really allowed me to grow over the course of the school year. Here's another fun one. Did you do any extracurricular activities? And if so, what were they? Yeah, so in undergrad, I, I did a lot. So I was able to study abroad. I also served as a mentor for both college and high school students as well. Um, I was also able to serve as an ambassador. So I was able to help individuals who came from similar backgrounds as me and be able to walk them through the journey of applying to college. Um, right now uh, at the University of Washington School of Medicine, I've been able to continue this work, serving as a co-lead for doctor for a day and be able to help high school students who are interested in medicine, get some exposure to medicine as well. What was your experience with finding and applying for scholarships and other kinds of aid? Yeah, that's a, another good question. Um, I feel like this, us, this is not often addressed uh, and it wasn't definitely addressed when I was in high school, uh, but being able to do some research on your own is definitely um, something that I would highly encourage. Uh, I know a lot of the well-known scholarships are national scholarships that are very hard to um, get uh, offered to or get those scholarships, but there's also some community scholarships and those, although they may not be like large amounts, if you apply to several and 
they offer you those scholarships, they actually build up over time. And um, that's something that you all should consider when uh, it, it comes time for you all to start thinking about college and applying to scholarships. Just put yourself out there, share your story uh, and try to find something that will help other people remember you. Were you able to get a time extension for test taking of the of taking the MCATs being an ESL student? No, that's a great question. I actually tried to uh, get some extension, but unfortunately, I wasn't able to get some um, some additional timing. However, what I did find was that doing practice uh, problems and practice passages, reading stuff on my own, that really helped me in terms of not only reading things um, more quickly, but also grasping and understanding what I was reading. All right, I think that is about time. Thank you so much, Dr. Alex. Everybody mm -hmm. give him some props. So next up we have Lieutenant Commander Jesus Reina is a commissioned officer with the U.S. Public Health Service and has been with the Department of Health and Human Services in Region 10 for over 18 years, serving as the Medical Reserve Coordinator, Minority Health Consultant, Title 10 Reproductive Health Project Officer, and currently with ASPR as a Regional Emergency Coordinator. In his commissioned office role, Lieutenant Commander Reyna has been deployed to assist with the Ebola crisis in Liberia, the Flint, Michigan water crisis, the Zika response in Puerto Rico, multiple unaccompanied, unaccompanied, I can't say that word, unaccompanied minor mission um, at the U.S.-Mexican border, hurricanes Irma and Maria response, and is currently deployed assisting with the COVID-19 federal response. He holds sociology and nursing degrees from the University of Washington and a master's in nursing in the family nurse practitioner program from Bradley University. Welcome, Jesus. Hi, everybody. So uh, thank you for that introduction. And as the slides, um, if they're able to bring those up, um, just want to talk a little bit more about myself. Um, I um, grew up as a migrant farm worker in the eastern part of the state. Uh, my family and I um, would move uh, from the eastern part of the, of, the, of the state, from Yakima up to the Skagit area, um, following the crops. And I, I did this all the way until um, I when I was five years old, all the way until I graduated from high school. Um, always was really interested in healthcare careers. Um, and one of the things that, um, you know, I, I was seen at community health centers as, as a child, and that's where my family and I um, would get our care. And um, for the longest time, uh, you know, I had never seen a, a, a primary care provider or health professional that was Latino. And at one of those clinics, uh, <clears throat> I believe I was 10 years old, uh, the primary care provider in the Skagit area, one of the smart clinics, um, spoke to me in Spanish. And uh, I think that was probably the first time I had seen somebody that, that was a doctor who spoke Spanish and I was able to have a conversation with them. And I think I realized at that time that I, I also could be a health professional. And, and that kind of implanted early in, in my mind and um, for years after that, um, uh, it was one of the things that um, I really wanted to do. So looking at this slide, I know that the theme for this, um, this uh, event is envision your future and keep it in focus. And one of the things that I, I did a little bit when I was in high school and then a little bit more in college, but then when I became a professional, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And this kind of became something that I um, always tried um, and really focused on, and that was um, um, uh, writing down um, what I wanted to do in my life. And, and like I tell my kids and, and other people is like, if you want to go on a trip, you want to have a map and you want to have a plan. And I started doing this um, um, early on uh, where um, this was basically written. I, I wrote it uh, August 7th, uh, 2003, um, which is pretty close to 20 years, uh, 20 years ago. And this is one of my first jobs that I had working with the association that I, um, that worked with all the community migrant health centers, the same kind of association and, and uh, system that uh, I received all my care as a, as a kid. 
And so, um, as you can see here, I, you know, I wrote all these different things and then put marriage and kind of growing up. And then I, I wanted to really improve my clinical or uh, presentation skills, clinical skills, and work with my community, migrant seasonal farm workers. And that's something that I, I had the opportunity to do and have been doing throughout my career and wanted to continue um, building on my clinical skills and, and work at, again, one of the clinics that I um, uh, received all my care at as a, as a, as a child. And um, I just always kind of kept this um, in front of me and I would update my goals, you know, would be, you know, like I, I think here's a two year period, but it's, it's something that I would encourage all of you to do. It's, it's in, very important to be able to write down your goals and then see them on a daily basis because then you start kind of building and pushing um, and, and moving towards that more and more as um, uh, the different work that you do. And I will tell you, you know, this is a lifelong kind of thing because I, oh, I wanted to do right out of nursing school, wanted to become a nurse practitioner. And um, it didn't take me until almost 20 years to um, finish uh, and finally, you know, with my career and everything, get the time um, to start working on my nurse practitioner program. And I completed that last summer and I did all my clinicals again because I really wanted to work with the Latino community because I'm bilingual and I'm bicultural. And it was the place that I received my care and I was able to do all my clinical rotations at the CMAR uh, clinics uh, here in the, in, in the Western Washington. And, uh, it, you know, it, it, it's something that I continue to add on. And that's why, you know, this was 20 years ago. And I went back and kind of checked off some of the things that I felt like I had accomplished. And I feel like, you know, there's still a lot more that I have. And this is just one of the ones that I found to share with you. But uh, uh, like I said, I kept updating these almost on uh, 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 every couple of years. I don't know why it's doing that. So I do apologize. Uh, uh, but one of the other things, you know, of the goals that I um, that I did have is, uh, uh, and I'm probably dating myself here, but I'm a really big uh, fan of MASH. And uh, I really was, uh, 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 every time I'd watched the show, I was so impressed at how, how um, skilled these individuals were and how they, they managed to take care of individuals under a very stressful environment. I mean, them being close to a, a war zone. And I, it was something that I always wanted to do and wanted to wear a uniform and be part of a process like that. And, um, you know, I found the U.S. Public Health Service and it was something that I joined uh, and has allowed me. And as uh, you heard in my bio, I've been able to travel um, internationally and then all over the United States working on and supporting uh, vulnerable populations when it comes to disasters like uh, Zika, uh, hurricanes, uh, and then some of the experiences of being able to work with children at the, at the U.S. border, um, especially being able, uh, because I'm a clinician and I, I'm bilingual, uh, be able to understand what these individuals are going through as they're trying to come through the border. Um, and so, um, as you can see in this slide, uh, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but I, um, while I was deployed in Liberia, I was living in a tent. Here are the showers. And this is the hospital where we were taking care of Ebola patients. And, um, you know, when I had one of the conversations with my wife and I was sending her pictures and she told me, you know, you're living your, your mash dream, the, what you always wanted to do. And, and when I looked at that, I was like, oh, I, I didn't really get it until she mentioned that to me. And I thought that, wow, that's really, really interesting that I did get to do that. Um, um, and it, it just kind of for me was, uh, um, again, one of the goals that I really wanted to reach in my life and I was able to do and be able to take care of patients um, in a very stressful environment um, in another country. I'm gonna to click to the next slide and hopefully. Um, and with this slide here, I really did wanna share it because I, once I became commissioned as a US Public Health Service officer, um, I was able to, um, uh, um, I ended up finding this picture because somebody gave me a U.S. Public Health book, a uh, U.S. Public Health Service uh, book. It's called Plague and, Plagues and Politics, and it just kind of covered the history of the, of the U.S. Public Health Service and the stuff that they did in the communities. Um, and this picture is really 
um, I guess kind of changed a lot of the focus of who I am as a health professional because um, my father used to come to the United States um, when he was 15, 16 years old um, as a bracero. He would come to work uh, in the fields. And um, every time I look at this picture, I always get kind of choked up a little bit because I can picture my father being um, one of these men um, that's being screened or vaccinated um, before they're coming into the country or being uh, able to work. And um, I can see that, you know, my father being here on this side of the, if you're looking at, you know, this side of the photo. And I don't think, you know, when I've had conversations with my father, that he would never have thought that um, one of his children would be on this side um, with this uh, U.S. public health officer who is also, um, who's um, providing the screening and care for these individuals. And um, when we have this conversation, I tell him, you know, that um, because of education and what, uh, you know, the struggles that we went in our lives and, and all the work that, that he did and that um, my family and I did, I was able to make the, the big leap of coming in as a, just a, as a farm worker or someone who, you know, uses their body for physical labor um, to becoming a, a health professional, someone who has uh, skills to be able to care for other individuals and have the ability to, to be able to uh, take care of individuals. And, that, and then, um, you know, when I look at this slide or this picture as well, it, it brings back all the, or the responsibilities as being a, a clinician with, and a, being a bilingual, bicultural clinician, understanding that there's a lot of vulnerable populations. These individuals are coming into the US to work. They don't speak the language and could easily be taken advantage of but being a health professional and understanding um, where they're coming from, I uh, would be able to give them, um, you know, at least under, a better understanding, just like the unaccompanied minor children that are coming through the border. I really do understand what they're going through, um, the struggles that they're going through to come into this country and be able to serve them. And so when you're thinking of uh, going into this profession, we need to look at, um, our responsibilities. And as all of you probably have been impacted by um, this COVID-19 pandemic, we have to look at who was disproportionately disadvantaged or, or uh, affected. And we see that, you know, a lot of the um, low income um, uh, racial and ethnic minorities, because of the lack of uh, access to health care, um, jobs that um, don't provide insurance, they're basically, um, their, um, some of them, their jobs being deemed essential, like migrant seasonal farm workers, individuals that work in processing plants, um, in transportation, all those jobs were like for myself, I you know, feel like very privileged. I was able to work from home. My wife was able to work from home and we were able to protect their families. A lot of these individuals had to continue to go to work, had to, um, um, provide for their families and could not, um, take the time off or isolate themselves like um, other people could. And so, you know, when looking at becoming a health professional and I, I will keep throwing this out that we have the responsibility to be able to um, care for those individuals. And that's why when I have the opportunity to talk to students uh, like yourselves, <clears throat> it's really important to help diversify the workforce uh, profession because um, we saw, and you probably saw this in your own community, in your own families, a lot of individuals um, were hesitant to get the vaccine. They didn't trust the government. They didn't have health professionals that looked like them that spoke the language and could talk to them and say, hey, you know, this is um, 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 a necessary vaccine to protect you and your family. You really need to get it. Or, you know, there's medications out there that you need to take and you don't have to wait until you, you know, get really sick. You can start trying to get, you know, go into the hospital so that we can try to help you as much as we can. And that's where I feel there's that gap in what we need right now. And, we, you know, we, as, as an individual who's worked in the government and has responded for, uh, um, during this pandemic, um, you know, I saw firsthand a lot of health professionals that got burned out and left the profession. And now, you know, more than ever, we need more individuals. And I know that there's the, the conversation that um, how to look for scholarships or, or the money that's out there. I'm here to tell you that, that 
funding will become available because of just the big need that we have in this country for um, health professionals and more, more so um, individuals that are bilingual and bicultural. And I will tell you that, you know, there, there's going to be some programs out there. I would, I would look as much as possible into uh, um, HRSA, uh, the Health Resource Service Administration. They'll, they're, um, they provide a lot of funding for individuals that want to work um, in low-income, underrepresented um, communities, um, work in community health centers, um, uh, like the ones that um, I received my care in and the ones that I did my clinical in. Um, so I, I would give you that um, advice to be able to look for that money. Um, I know Alex mentioned um, looking for mentors. I did that myself. I didn't know what I was doing and why I was going to go into a healthcare career. But I will tell you that um, um, I found somebody and I ended up doing a certain thing where um, I uh, started, I offered them to buy them lunch and uh, just so that I can spend an hour with them and trying to get information about the process of going and becoming a health professional and what I needed to do, because it's not, it's not an easy process. And um, Alex did mention, you know, you, you, you might get rejected or you may, may fail or you feel like you're going to get rejected. But um, if in the end, if, if, if it's something that you want to do and the impact in your community, you'll continue to go through that process. But uh, um, I'll go ahead and stop at this point and see if there's um, questions I'll stop sharing here. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, you have a lot of questions. How do you, how did you avoid burnout? Like a lot of healthcare providers have. Well, I'll tell you that um, I was going to school while I'm responding. So uh, I don't know how I avoided it. I'm probably still burnt out right now because uh, I was doing clinical, I was responding with a, a new job. Um, I wasn't seeing my family very much because I was behind a desk uh, for the last three years, just trying to uh, finish my master's. But um, I think, you know, the, the biggest way was trying to carve that little bit of time with my family. Um, and if it was my kid coming in to talk to me, I, I, I didn't brush him away. I didn't shoo him away. I would be like, all right, uh, you know, let him talk, say what he needs to say. And then I'll be like, I'm, I'm working right now. Um, I'll, I'll talk to you later. But uh, really trying to carve out that time to spend, spend with my family. Do you have any advice for low-income Latinos who want to be in healthcare? Yes. Uh, I would say that if, if you're really interested, uh, again, try to find yourself uh, mentors, connect yourself, try to surround yourself with individuals that are um, going into those type of fields because they, they know where, where the resources are at. They'll be able to connect you to individuals because I'll tell you, um, I didn't have any money. I was able to get government grants, loans, and, and things like that in the combination. But um, really, you know, connecting myself with individuals because I wouldn't have made it. Um, I was able to get some scholarships, um, especially towards the end when I got into the nursing school. But um, there is a lot of funding and will be a lot of funding available through the federal government. Again, there's, there's programs right now um, that not a lot of people take advantage of. But um, individuals need to understand that uh, th these programs, the government also wants a little bit of your time. If they're going to fund fund you, they're going to want you to work um, in areas where there's low um, health professional. Uh, so you may end up having to go into back into your community. For me, um, that was no brainer. I would have gone back to Yakima if they would have paid for all my education. My path took me a different way. Um, but I'll tell you that my master's was fully paid by because I'm in the unit with the U.S. Public Health Service. So I saved over 60 some thousand dollars. But um, by being in this service and um, I'm preparing myself. So when I retire in the next 10 years to be able to work fully at a community health center and be able to, to give back to my community. So I feel like I'm not just taking, but I'll be able to give back a little bit. Um, well, that's all the time we have for Jesus. Everybody give him a round of applause. You'll see that in the messages, Jesus. <laughs> and then if we didn't get to your questions again, we will post them on the website. Thank you. Okay. So next we have Sophia Aragon. She is a registered nurse an attorney and the executive director for the Washington Center for Nursing, a nonprofit organization that seeks to solve the nursing shortage. 
She is a product of public schools, attending Seattle Public Schools, graduated from Issaquah High School, and earned a bachelor's degree from the University of Washington, Seattle. In 1975, Sophia immigrated to Seattle with her parents from the Philippines. Her mother was one of the many thousands of Filipino nurses recruited to practice in the United States. Sophia watched how her mom worked to support their family and made sure they had stability that not everyone had. Following in her mom's footsteps, she started, started as a registered nurse in a hospital, then decided to work in a clinic near the neighborhood where she grew up. Advocating for the needs of patients inspired her to do larger community work. She would take on different work to help pass laws to help more people get access to health care, including immigrants, immigrants and people of diverse backgrounds. She also volunteered at several organizations, including Asian Pacific Americans for Civic Empowerment, to encourage, encourage those in the Asian community to be more active in government, and the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance to help solve homelessness and provide affordable homes for people in our state. In 2019, she was elected to a four-year term on the Burien City Council. In 2022, the City Council elected her mayor, the first women, woman of color to hold the office. She earned a bachelor's degree of arts in, econo arts and economics from the University of Washington, a bachelor of science in nursing from Seattle University, and a law degree from Loyola University, a Chicago School of Law. All right, welcome, Mayor Aragon. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, thank you, everybody, and a pleasure to be here. And um, I'm just curious before I start my presentation, uh, wondering if folks in the audience would just kind of type in and under the questions like, "What do you think nurses do?" and of those things, um, what do you see yourself um, wanting to explore or would like to do yourself as a health professional? To make a difference, I see definitely assisting doctors, OBGYN, great. Actually, one of the things I wanted to be in my, in my career that kind of took twists and turns, as you can see, is to be a nurse midwife, which is an advanced practice nurse that delivers babies. And I'm not very sure on how you would describe it. Um, calm people, that's very important. I think about behavioral health and mental health that we need and many people need it after COVID. Advocacy, good answer. That's something that you will be very well trained to do um, and probably not even know it. Um, tending to patient needs, help others and save lives and communicating with patients. Those are really great answers. And so thank you so much for sharing. Um, so I will share a little bit about my experience um, as a registered nurse and my uh, varied experience here. So this is a picture of my aunt. Um, uh, my aunt, I call her Aunt Baby. Her really name is Aunt Joan. She were, that was her nickname, Aunt Baby. And here I am as a three-year-old um, at the airport in Manila, and she's saying goodbye to me. Um, as I left with my mom and dad to the United States as my mom was recruited to be a nurse. And given all of you who um, kind of know a little bit about what it takes to get into nursing school, can you guys take a guess as to why she didn't get into nursing school? It was one of her dreams, but she wasn't accepted in the school. So um, what are your guesses as to why she didn't make it in? Race, language. She didn't get her education in the United States, has had a child. Financial status, lack of a visa. Well, interestingly enough, and she did um, apply to nursing school in the Philippines, um, she was too short which if that sounds ridiculous, it was. And I'm just saying that the qualifications to be a nurse has really evolved tremendously over time. And, um, but she was very passionate about caring for people. And I will talk about um, what uh, in her life has led her to do nursing, not professionally, but for um, her family and her children. So, but anyway, she was a huge supporter of me growing up and I'll forever be grateful to her. Yes, and that is sad. 
Thank you for that comment. So overall, um, registered nursing, nursing overall, is the largest health profession in the state of Washington and in the nation. So overall in our country, there are 3.3 million nurses out there working. And as of March of this year, um, and I've listed nurses here in terms of, and there's other classes of nurses, but according to the amount of education that's required of you, we have about 11,000 licensed practical nurses. Most of them do work in long-term care. Um, registered nurses, we have over 100,000 of them. Slightly half work in the hospital, but they have uh, many other places where they work. And then advanced registered nurse practitioners, which requires um, an advanced degree, a graduate degree, at least a master's here in the state of Washington, we have about 11,000 of them. So um, if you were to choose nursing, um, you really would choose uh, being part of a very large group and therefore can be very influential um, in healthcare. So um, today I wanted to share with you, like why do we need nurses that reflect the diversity of our communities? Well, in short, we wanna make sure that our nursing workforce keeps up with our community in terms of who's in it, um, the cultures that we have, languages we might speak, which all translates into how well our care is going to make us healthy. So about 10 years ago in 2012, minorities were only about 37% of the US population. And by 2060 was projected, or you know, if they looked into the future, minorities would be about 57% of our nation. And as you can tell there, the word, of, the word minority isn't going to be relevant um, according to this projection. So in 2020 though, we saw that in Washington state, we're about 80% 80, 80 white. Um, so not really that diverse back then. And one of the challenges we have with nursing is that our demographics, race and ethnicity, um, doesn't match up with our population. And nursing knows that and is really making an effort to recruit um, diverse um, nurses and students into our profession. And one of the key reasons why this is so important to us is that there are differences in how uh, people in their health and how long is how long they live. So the two things we look at in terms of different groups um, and I'll show some examples later, is two things. One, how long someone's going to live, and two, the quality of life. And I'll talk about that a little later um, and where healthcare fits and all of that. But if you see in this slide, you know, by 2020, um, um, the percentage of students who uh, identified with white was only 53%. So it already started to lower considerably among our students. But if you look at the kindergarten class of 2017, okay, so that was quite a while ago, um, already more than half of students identified with the community of color. Um, so we have a much, much, much more diverse set of young people. And the hope is that we have a nursing workforce that reflects them and their cultures. So, but we know this um, in terms of the community is that to better meet the current and future health needs of the public and provide culturally relevant care, we do need to increase nurses' level of educational attainment. And this needs to be addressed across all levels of education. So whether you are a licensed practical nurse or one of our nursing assistants, for example, or our nursing professors or the advanced practice nurses that you saw, um, we really do need to do more work in terms of diversity so that we can serve our diverse communities better. So here's an example as to why. So when I came to the Center for Nursing, there was this research question, right? And when you have research, what you do is you go out and ask to the community and say, okay, here's a problem, what are we gonna do? And so one of the things that um, a former researcher in my office did around 2015 was to ask the deans and directors. So these are nurses who had nursing programs 
across Washington State and said, okay, you are experts in educating our nurses. What do you think could we, we could do to recruit more diverse students? Now, keep in mind, nursing educators, and I have showed you the, 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 da the data and demographics around race and ethnicity in Washington in general, um, deans and directors of nursing, they tend to be old, much older than um, the rest of nursing, and they're also much less diverse. So coming from their perspective, their top answers was, number one, working with local high schools, and that certainly is what we are doing with you today. That's a very traditional answer. And if you notice at the very bottom was 23% said, we need to bring their families in the process. And some schools said that they actually did family nights. So they would invite um, mothers and fathers um, and, or those who took care of students to come in and learn about what nursing is and what is, what is required and how to get into nursing school. And I thought that there was a bit of a gap there because I thought, well, you know, why don't we ask nursing students themselves, because being much younger, they went through periods of schooling and probably saw some efforts to get more diverse students. So what would they say? And is it different from our nurse educators, who again, were very diverse? So how we did this was I assembled a team of nurses who were getting their master's degree at the University of Washington, Bothell School of Nursing. In the middle here is Fenice Okioma, and she is a um, an immigrant from uh, um, Africa. And I'm thinking, I want to say New Guinea, um, but I may not be correct about that. And then Molly Albrer, who was very passionate about this, this subject. And what they did was do some research about, so what are some questions out there that we can typically ask to get at the heart of this solution. And one of the things that, that Fenice and myself actually raised when we saw these sample questions was nobody asked about family because from her experience, her family was a huge influence in helping her decide to choose nursing as a career. So I just want you to remember that Fenice was the one to make the suggestion that we need to ask students how important families were in choosing nursing and their support. So we took this, this set of questions and the one about family to the Washington State Student Nurses Association and also had some open discussions to get their thoughts, okay? Asking generally again, okay, nursing students, what should we do to make nursing more diverse? And so here are the answers that came out of the survey and over half said, my family encouraged me to go to nursing, which the significance of that is that Fenice, as a diverse nurse herself, was the one who had the influence to say, you know, from my experience, we need to ask students this question. So if it weren't for her, this family question would have not made it into the survey and we wouldn't have found the top answer from these diverse students, which is their family. So it's really important to involve diverse people when we're trying to solve issues that relates to their care or their education and healthcare, okay? So here's my mom um, and that's me as a baby and that's her in her nursing uniform back in the Philippines. And she is the reason why I'm here in the United States today. And um, as my bio said, she was very inspiring to me because when I looked around in my family and there were a handful of nurses, regardless of what the economics were at the time, because as you know, you know, a country comes, goes through booms and busts, it seemed like the nurses were always the ones to be able to put food on the table and a roof over their heads. And at the end of the day, she's the one who is responsible for paying for most of my education, including law school. I always say that nursing is opportunity. About half of nursing students are first generation, are the first generation to go to college. So this is the result of that survey that I shared for you with you. Okay. And so out of that survey, also, what we did was we filmed a number of diverse nursing students who shared different stories about how their family helped them get through school. For, for example, some nurses 
um, decide to study when they already have children. So one nurse talked about how her parents um, and maybe cousins and other family members provided childcare because she literally had to drive up and down the sound to get to her clinicals. Um, we had another student talk about how her family didn't hesitate um, to allow her to stay at home for as long as she wanted until she finished school. Um, or another student saying it was really important uh, to hear their parents ask, you know, how are you doing or to cheer them on. Um, so this video and I put I, I, uh, um, I uploaded it to the website for this event and it's also on our WCN website. It's used by a few um, nursing schools in terms of their orientation to nursing so that families have some idea as to how to support their students. Okay. The other thing we want to be aware of, like I said, two things that we track, how long someone lives and their quality of life or how well they live and how healthy they can be. Um, this is a chart showing all the different things that go into that for a person. So here I am, look at this, clinical care is only 20% of what determines how long someone lives and how well they live. So me working at my best with my physician and nurse colleagues at a hospital or a clinic, we impact about 20% of this. But look at social and economic factors. What are those? Education, your educational level, your employment. Do you feel like you're well-employed? Do you feel financially secure, your income? the support you have of family, community safety. And look at this, physical environment, the air and water where you grew up or are living, the housing and transit that are available to you, that makes up half of how well you live and how long you'll live. And then also note healthy behaviors, right? If you smoke tobacco, that's gonna impact um, this for you. Diet and exercise, alcohol or drug use can impact um, your length of life and quality of life, and actually more, right, the way you behave more than, again, me and my physician or nurse colleagues taking care of you in the hospital or the clinic. So this is something that nurses always have to keep in mind when the patient comes in and we have to see them, is that we can't just look at what medications they have, what's their diagnosis, why did they come in, were they in an accident, are they pregnant having a baby? Are they suffering from a disease? We need to look at all of these things to see how we can make them healthier and also what is surrounding them that is negatively impacting their health. Okay. Um, so here's an example. So health equity is talking about how fair is it for people to uh, live a healthy life. And there's two components, as we've talked about. One is your race and ethnicity, and two are those social determinants in that last slide, education, income, where you live, whether you have housing, for example. And in COVID-19, we really saw this come to light. For example, so for Black and African American, rates for COVID-19 were two times higher than the white population. For the Hispanic population, uh, they suffered from COVID-19 three times higher. And there were some populations um, that were caught really late because they were so small in number that they were often ignored, which is another way for us to miss whether or not health disparities occur um, in a population. Okay. So I'm going to turn to uh, my role at Burien City Council to give you an example of social determinants or impact in the environment. So Burien is an airport city because we, we are located very close to SeaTac Airport. It's the eighth largest airport in the nation. And the majority of people of color in the state actually live 10 miles within the airport. And this is, I'll just caution, this is called a descriptive study, meaning this is what researchers see across many airports. It may not be exactly the impact of a population, um, but this is what they have seen happening in airports across the country. So compared to those who don't live near an airport, there are disparities or they have, they're different in, in their health. They have poor health. They're at different risk factors for health and they have different resources. Some may be more low income 
because land may be cheaper to live on near an airport, given all the noise and the disruption. And when we see, we look at people's health, those who are close to the airport, we see higher hospitalization rates for heart disease. The rate of death from any cause is higher um, and life expectancy is actually lower. Okay, and so here are some other examples and I won't dive into that. Um, and I'll just share that a research uh, project that uh, WCN did show that the nurses of color also experienced um, more negative experience during COVID-19 than um, the white workforce. Here's a, here is an article from the Harvard Business Review saying that Black healthcare workers were more negatively impacted. Um, and some of the reasons are that uh, um, nurses and physicians from communities of color, they often wanted to serve the community in which they came. And if it was a very diverse community, often those hospitals didn't have very good resources. Um, they also were few in terms of diverse healthcare professionals and didn't really have people to lean on to help them get through these tough times. So that turned into burnout for a lot of healthcare professionals, and it's been recognized um, in the state. So, you know, representing our communities and leadership really matter. So here's some research that healthcare professionals for underrepresented groups significantly more likely than their white colleagues to remain in or to return and practice in their communities who are underserved typically. And importantly though, that when we have an underrepresented nurse in the influ influential leadership role, they can directly influence resources. They, they influence recruitment. They influence whether or not their workforce stays and works and also national policies aimed at eliminating health disparities. So back to my example in Burien, um, if it weren't for my knowledge of public health as a nurse, those statistics would not have come in front of leadership at SeaTac Airport itself, um, the Federal Aviation Administration. Um, I've also worked with members of Congress and actually um, Adam Smith, who is a congressman for Washington State, uh, recently introduced a bill that said that communities need to have input when they are expanding airport operations, knowing that it directly inputs their communities. And here at the center, we also work really hard whenever we recruit um, uh, for staff in the office that our pool of applicants is really wide and from diverse communities um, because we know that their voice is really important, um, especially for our organization that can have influence on the nursing workforce. Um, this is a picture of myself. I'm in the middle. And this is uh, Renton City Council member Kim, Kim Con Van. She is a Vietnamese American. She immigrated here when she was nine. And um, to your right here is former mayor Jimmy Mata, who is the first Latino mayor of the city of Burien. And we worked with Kim to hold a rally in Burien to shed light on um, the issue of um, bias against Asian Americans because COVID was perceived to be um, originating from Asia um, or China specifically. And Burien was one of over 130 cities that um, council member Kim Con Van um, rallied across the state. So the key here again is to make sure that when you want to address something um, that impacts the health of diverse communities. You've got to involve community members themselves to have a say in what those solutions are, including how do we improve a workforce that better serves their needs. Okay, and here's that chart again. So um, in our, in the, on our website, I have some stories of nurses. Um, it's called Spotlight, and I also uploaded that onto um, the web page here, and they have stories here of nurses um, who are diverse and talk about how uh, what their nursing practice is and how they're important to care. Um, Sir Cecilia Perez talking about that she can quickly build rapport with a Spanish-speaking person um, because it's her community, and health and health disparities are incredibly important to address. 
Um, so registered nurses, most of us work in hospitals, but in COVID, we can see that we need them in other areas. Public health, only 1% of us work there. School health, only 2.5% of us work there. Not in long-term care, less than 10%. So we need nurses to consider these other areas for work. And this is Ricky Peck, who her first experience was actually working in a jail um, and talks about how unique that was. One of my, my favorite things to do was be a triage nurse in my clinic, um, where I worked very independently and the physicians and other staff really depended on me to figure out um, what were the key things that they needed to know about the patient um, so that we can give them the best pair possible on the, an emergency situation. And this is one of my students, actually. We have students come through the center to get experience in what nursing leadership looks like. And this is Matthew Clark, who is a charge nurse with Seattle, uh, King, Seattle King County Public Health, um, who led some teams to work to um, provide um, care to patients who were um, affected with COVID, as, and particularly vaccination clinics. Okay, so um, I agree with Alex um, and um, Jesus when they say find your team. And this is a list of nursing organizations that specifically work to support um, certain communities, National Association of Hispanic Nurses, the Pacific Northwest Chinese Nurses Association. There's the Philippine Nurses, for example, Mary Mahoney Professional Nurses Organization for African American Nurses and there are also Native American associations. Okay. And this is another nurse, Anna Lott Wright, who is Native American. And here I included it because she talked about how nursing also involves, uh, evolves with um, whatever interests our community has around it, for example, IT, and that she would encourage people to complete their education as soon as possible because it opens so many doors for you once you do that. So here's my auntie Joan, um, and a quick story is that here's my uncle Marcio, and he was an engineer. They immigrated here eventually together. Um, and uncle Marcio was a really strong provider. One day in his 70s, he fell in the bathroom, and this is really common with older people fall injuries. And it's, he hit his head and became permanently disabled unable to get out of bed or care for himself for a good 10 years. And here's my auntie Joan that I talked about who really wanted to be a nurse. And she retired and took care of him 24 seven for 10 years after his injury. They both passed away last year from COVID-19 <clears throat> at 71 and 75. They were exposed by some children who were visiting their grandchildren when we didn't have a vaccine yet. Um, and they passed away within eight hours of each other. So <clears throat> even though Washington nurses have had challenges like many others through COVID, um, the surveys that we did show that RNs agree when we ask that their work gives them a sense of accomplishment and that's something we're really proud of. Okay, so I'll leave it there for questions. Um, what has been your most proud moment my most proud moment. Well, I thought my most enjoyable moment in nursing school, because this is something that actually happens with luck, um, was helping to deliver two babies within like three hours of each other. And the hard part about that is that when you're in a clinical rotation, it's hard to know if something is actually going to occur. Like other, other common things, like for example, heart attacks and things like that. You, of course, you hope they never occur, but you hope you have a learning experience out of it. But in, in nursing schools now, we can simulate all of those things. There's actually, um, you know, there are robots that could deliver babies and have heart attacks and they look very human and nurses could practice and learn those skills without really fearing how to harm, or not, sorry, the fear of harming patients. So technology has gone a really long way, but I was really proud to be able to help those two moms deliver their babies. And it gave me such a huge appreciation for the female body, just going through that. It was just the most amazing thing to witness in my life, I think. What value does diversity bring to the workplace? 
Um, I think diversity brings the it, the value is that of different ideas and different perspective. Um, you know, it's that feeling of when the same problem keeps coming up over and over again, and it's for a community that you don't really know, or it's not, they're not anywhere near you, um, especially in the workplace. And you try your best to figure out what can we do to address that issue. But if there's no one there representing the community, that's very hard. And you're just kind of guessing. But when you have someone there, they might have some really key input, like my student, Phineas. Um, and also it, it kind of, I think uh, it makes, there's a natural fear, I think, of others that aren't like you or you don't understand them. Here's a kind of a funny story. So I did some of my practicum at Harborview Medical Center, which I really loved. Um, my mother-in-law worked there as a nurse for over 30 years. And um, I followed her into the locker room at the end of her shift once. And she was talking with another Filipino friend. And then they were just open in their locker and they they moved into Ilocano, which is one of the dialects. And I was with my nursing preceptor who was white. And she said, oh, they must not want me to hear what they're saying. And I said, oh, no, she just, my, my mother-in-law said that, oh, darn, I, for, I forgot my shoe bag. Now I have to leave my shoes in my locker and I got to wear my shoes back home. And she didn't want to do that to drag all this, you know, bacteria into her house. And so I just kind of laughed at that because, you know, they it just was easier for her to talk to her best friend, the nurse in their native language. And there was no intent to hide what they were saying. Um, but so, but if that was just much more routine or, you know, people are more comfortable asking, so, hey, what's so funny over there, over by the locker, then there wouldn't be such a mystery and sort of this fear of the unknown um, with other people working with you. Here's the other thing too, another story is that when I was working with a physician in the clinic, she was taking care of a, a Somali woman who didn't speak English. And one of her practice rules was she didn't want to give care unless there was a translator. So in came her patient, one of her favorite patients. The, the interpreter didn't show up. And so she sent her home. Nine months later, she had a baby. And she was trying to tell um, my provider that that was going to be an issue for her and wanted to know her options because it wasn't something that she felt like she could have. Um, and so she felt, the physician I worked at felt really badly that she didn't even want to communicate with her unless there was um, a translator. And we ended up with a health outcome that we could have better supported that mother with. So, you know, when you have the unfamiliarity or inability to communicate and I have so many other stories that even happened to me, um, then just when we don't have those things, then care isn't as good as it could be. Um, that is all the time we have. James, did you want to wrap it up? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you to all of our presenters. Man, what a fantastic job to Alex, Jesus, Sophia, and Molly. Let's give a virtual round of applause. Wow, fantastic stories. I feel more motivated. Yes, indeed, Antonio, Caitlin, and everyone else. Thank you for all the different comments. Um, we're wrapping up this conversation just now, and we just have a few more presentation slides. And this is going to be for you to be able to um, sh see how you can definitely win prizes. I am going to um, go ahead and share my screen. And so, Sophia, if I could have you stop sharing your screen, that would be good. And then I will start sharing mine. Thank you very much. Um, and we just have a few more slides, and this is the probably one of the best parts because we're going to tell you how you can win more prizes. Uh, for everybody who's come in today, you have already won $5 to Starbucks, so congratulations. And you know, all these prizes, they are brought to you by some amazing partners. Um, not only do we want to thank Alex, Jesus, Sophia, and Molly for doing such an amazing job, but we also want to thank all of our sponsors. Here are just some of our sponsors who make it possible today. And these are from around your community as well. You can kind of look at all the different logos and see. Uh, we've got Pierce College, AHEC Western Washington, Seattle's Children's, Clover Park, Workforce Central, 
uh, WACTA, the Washington Association and Career of Technical Administrators, Tacoma Community College, WCN, the Washington Center for Nursing, Workforce Development Council of Seattle King County, Bates Technical College, Kaiser Permanente, Highland College, Tacoma Public Schools, WABS, Washington Alliance for Better Schools, Seattle Jobs Initiative, and the Hilt Health Industry Leadership Table. Virtual round of applause to our speakers and moderators and our sponsors. Thank you. Uh, now we're going to get into some fun stuff. This is how you can win prizes. And we've got cash prizes. We have a lot of cash prizes. Uh, right now, we have a scavenger hunt that's going to be coming up. Uh, it's from Children's Hospital. And this is going to be one of the most fun events and activities that you're going to be doing. And so you're going to learn more on that. Uh, do we have Shauna in the in the room to able to come into the conversation and share her information about the scavenger hunt? I don't know if Shauna's in the room right now, but I can go over this for you. As you know, Children's Hospital is sponsoring a scavenger hunt. Easy peasy, focus and complete the scavenger hunt. You have until Thursday, 9 p.m. to complete the scavenger hunt. One random winner will be announced and it will be Friday by 3 p.m. that we will announce the winner. This could be you. Uh, for all of you that are here, you're going to get the first one in to have the ability to start showing up for the scavenger hunt. I'm going to look at messaging right now. Oh, Shauna, um, Shauna's here. Shauna, are, if you're able to unmute, I don't see you having the talking ability, so I'm going to go ahead and take it from here. I don't believe you can. But the scavenger hunt is a great way for you to learn more about Children's Hospital. And like I said, there's going to be one big winner, and we're going to go over that in just a little bit on how you can win that. One of the quotes that I, I picked up was 95% of success is just showing up. And I'm going to tell you here and now, everybody who has shown up today, you are in the winning for some big prizes. And it's going to be very, very exciting. Once again, stay tuned to learn how you can win more prizes. Everyone who registered, you already received a $5 gift card. Congratulations. Now, you have the ability, and you have some really good odds, you have the ability to win 26 different ways. What? Yes, 26 different ways. There's three opportunities each day for $50 gift cards. That's right, $50 for you to complete the Envision Your Future activities. The link will be shared into the message box and you can start getting that accomplished. These are due every day by 9 p.m. So you have until 9 p.m. tonight to finish this survey and you will be in the running for three opportunities to win $50 today. So make sure you do that. Um, at the end of the week, here's another way that you can win some money. At the end of the week, we are going to be giving out $500. We're going to be giving out $250. We are going to be giving out five different prizes for people who come every day. And I'm going to give you a little hint. Today, if you are here and you can hear my voice, you're already in the running for one of these five prizes. All you have to do is show up, come every day, be active, set it on your phone, and you will be in the running. We know when you go join us on this platform, and at the end, we're gonna have a raffle. Lots of prizes coming your way, but wait, I've got more. We have the scavenger hunt. That's gonna be worth $250 for you just to do the scavenger hunt. I think there's a great presentation. You learn more information and it is due by Thursday. So we will announce the scavenger hunt winner on Friday. And guess what? Remember that leadership board that I talked about? Well, we're gonna take at the end of the week, we're gonna take the top five people on the leadership board and they're gonna to win too. They're going to win $100 for number one leaderboard. They're going to win $50 for the next two. And then for the next two, we're going to give them $25 in a gift card. These are all calculated after the virtual event. 
Why? Because we still have Friday, and on Friday, you can still rack up points. So wherever you're standing on Friday, you don't want anyone to bump you off if you're one of the top five on Friday. So make sure that you keep engaged and stay asking questions just like you're doing. Go to all the sessions, complete all the activities, do all the surveys, and make sure you stay engaged. That's right. So here we go. Envision your future. What we're going to do is we are going to put a link inside the message box. And it's going to include all the material that you have that you want to complete this Envision Your Future Exercise 1. Three easy questions. We want you to think about your future. And what do you look like and what do you like best about yourself? Remember, this is in 10 years. We want to know that information. Where will you be living? Will you be living in Washington State or somewhere else? And then what does your home look like? I want you to really bring it to us. Tell us what your home looks like. Tell us what makes it so wonderful and really help us understand that. This will be due by 9 p.m. tonight. So it's a quick turnaround. It's already five o'clock, just about. You got four hours to do this. What we're gonna be all the people that complete this survey, we're going to announce the winners tomorrow. So from all the people that submit it, we're gonna do a randomizer and we're gonna select three winners for $50 each. Every day, every day. So this is just on day one. Wait till you come over to day two. Here's some more ways to win. All right, here you go. This is the big one. This is where I get excited. Once again, you have two chances to win $500. You have two chances to win $250. I know it sounds crazy, I agree. I told everybody we shouldn't give them this much money, but they said, James, we're going to do it. So here we are. So now everybody who comes every day is in the running to win one of these four big prizes. So if you can hear my voice, if you see me on my screen, you know that you're already in the running to win one of these four big prizes. So get excited. Uh, this is really incredible. Now, remember, just want to paint it out for you. This is for people who attend every single day. If one of your colleagues that's here now is not here tomorrow, they're out of the running to win one of these four big prizes. If you're not here for the next four days, you're out of the running to win one of these big four prizes. But guess what? Everybody who's here every single day can win. And so I just think that's amazing. I really think that's amazing. Uh, so I think that's gonna be really fun. And so we want everything to go really well for you. So make sure you join us. Today, we did start kind of late. Our apology about that. We did run a little bit longer. My apology about that. In the future, in the next few days, we will stay on task. We will end at 4.30. So thank you for all those for being patient. Uh, this will be recorded and available for review as well. And we're going to make sure and include all of the different presentations as well so that you can see that. Um, so what we want to do is we're going to give all the different links inside the messages, copy the links, make sure you know where they're at, and we're going to send that out as well. So join us tomorrow, the same link that you join us today. We are doing it at three o'clock. We're going to be on time. We're not going to be late and we're going to start. And boy, do we have some fantastic sessions, presenters, activities, prizes, conversations, bring your genuine self and know that you are here to focus in your future and keep your vision alive.